hope you can manage to stay awake before we get drinks later on. I'm Hugh Weyers, I'm a build master at Topdesk, and uh, in that role I uh, work or struggle with Jenkins uh, every day. And I collected 40 tips uh, for you. But first, let me get to know my audience. Who here in the audience, raise your hand if you do, uh, uses Jenkins? Wow, that's, uh, that's a lot, nice. Um, anybody still on the predecessor of Jenkins, Hudson? No, that's good, <laughs> because it's a predecessor for a reason. Um, there are several alternatives, Bamboo, anyone? Team City, Travis, Circle, just an occasional hand, okay. So, uh, are there maybe even people who don't use CI at all? It's interesting. Um, there has been a survey done uh, on the state of the uh, JVM e ecosystem, and Jenkins is still the most used CI system. Uh, but maybe the most interesting here is that 21% of the people say they do not use any CI system. So I'm really wondering why. I'm going to talk about uh, three topics globally. First one is setting up your Jenkins. The second one is setting up your jobs. And the third one, that's going to be some more advanced topics like monitoring and security. And these tips, uh, I'm trying to get uh, one of them, uh, one tip per minute. And they come in uh, three difficulty levels. The first one is for the, uh, it will have this icon next to it. It's the regular read-only Jenkins users, the people who know that they have a Jenkins run in and that they should look there when their build has failed. Uh, but they don't really tend to do a lot with it. The next level are the power users. These are the people who know their way around Jenkins a bit. They can create a job uh, and feel comfortable uh, clicking around. Then the last category are the Jenkins masters. These are typically the administrators or uh, the go-to guys who will always know the spe one specific plugin for your specific use case. Any question you have, they can answer it. So, here we're going to go. Setting up Jenkins. The easiest way is to use Docker. Jenkins is also available uh, in the APT uh, store, but then you have to do all these kinds of nasty commands, adding your, uh, your package lists. You have to install Java yourself. Let's not do this. Let's take a pre-packaged Docker image. And this is a command uh, that you use to start it up. One thing to note here is that we do use a volume mount for the uh, var Jenkins home directory. And this is to ensure that all the job configuration and all the job results are stored in between runs of your Docker run. So when you execute this command, you'll see this appear in the command line somewhere and be sure to copy this uh, password, because you're going to need it later on. Tip number two is that you should use the Jenkins slash Jenkins image. There uh, are two images in uh, Docker Hub currently. One is the official repository, which is deprecated. Don't use that. Use the Jenkins slash Jenkins repository. It has uh, weekly releases, LTS releases, and it's uh, the one you should use. Now, Jenkins comes with a first-time installer and that will help you get going with Jenkins. It looks a bit like this. First you copy paste the, the, the password that you got from the console, and then you're presented with an option. Do you want to install the, uh, the suggested plugins, or do you want to choose yourself? And I always recommend people to do review those plugins. If you, select, uh, if you say you want to select your, uh, the plugins yourself, still the uh, suggested plugins are pre-selected, so you can easily review them, what uh, would have been installed, and maybe you can uncheck some, like uh, Subversion, anyone still using that? No? And uh, AND uh, is typically not really used often anymore. Now this is a manual step to install your plugins. I like automation, so let's see if we can automate that. There is a way to provision your plugins. Um, Inside the Docker container, there's a little shell script called install plugins. It will take a list of plugins and will install that. 
uh, you can call it with this uh, docker exec command. And after you did this, you will have to restart uh, Jenkins because it was already running when the plugins were installed. We can skip this restart step by rolling our own Docker image. And then we just put all those plugins in a little text file and then make sure that when we start the Docker image that these, uh, this install plugin script is called. Now, this only installs plugins. You still have to configure them yourself. I don't like to do manual work, so let's automate that. There is a new project, it's just been released for a couple of months now, and it's called Jenkins Configuration as Code, in which you can specify your plugins and your configuration of those plugins in a uh, YAML file. Uh, I won't dive too deep into detail here, but this is the link. Uh, the slides, by the way, are also going to be uh, shared on the GoToCopenhagen website, so you don't have to try to memorize all these URLs. Uh, I hope you, that you can just uh, look them up later. Now we have set up our uh, Jenkins master, and we can run jobs on that. But you shouldn't do that. You should use agents. Now why is that? If you use a default installation of Jenkins, the master will have two build executor slots. That mean that means that two jobs can uh, run at the same time. And this is fine for small projects, but if you do want to compile that one million lines of code in a big Maven process that takes two hours, yeah, you can only have two running at the same time, and the rest should have to wait until those two are done. So we go to the settings, and we go to the uh, computers, or the nodes, and there you get an overview of which uh, nodes are available. Uh, node terminology, uh, it used to be called slaves, but that wasn't culturally appropriate anymore, so it has been renamed to agents. But on some places you still see nodes or computers, so it, they all refer to the same thing, agents. So in this case, we see that there's only one agent, the master agent. But we can easily add a, add a new one using SSH or JNLP. Uh, JNLP goes over the port 50,000, which is what was opened in the Docker command for those uh, who uh, were questioning about that. And if we add a new node, then yeah, we can link up any VM, any bare metal machine that we want. And as you can see also here is that the architecture is listed of all these machines. Because it makes sense to have uh, different agents running different operating systems. If you have an, have an application that runs on Windows and on Linux, then probably you want to test it also on both Windows and Linux. So using multiple agents, you can uh, achieve that. Now, adding these agents in the GUI, clicking around, it's manual work. I don't like it. Thankfully, there's the Swarm plugin. We can automate this. And the Swarm plugin is a service that you install on your agent, on your VM or your bare metal machine. And that will make sure that it will automatically register itself to a Jenkins master. Um, this is linked to the to the plugin, and it works pretty useful. But installing a service on a machine, manual work. I don't like manual work, especially not if I have to install a hundred of these machines. So can we automate this even a step further? And we can. Um, what we do at uh, our company, uh, we automated our agent provisioning using Ansible. And we worked, worked really hard to make our agents ephemeral. Difficult word, what does it mean? Um, what we try to achieve is that we have agents that we can just throw away if we don't need them anymore. Or if we need more of them, we can just boot them up and they start to work automatically. No manual tasks involved. So that's what we mean with this ephemeral. Um, Docker images, for example, can also be used as agents and they are perfectly ephemeral. Now this is uh, the part about setting up Jenkins. When you've done these steps, you have a master, you have several agents. Now let's have a look at, uh, yeah, at doing some, putting them to work. And I'm going to start with a question for you guys again. Which build tool 
do you guys use for your main project? Are you all still on Maven? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, Gradle? Yes. The other people still using Ant or Make? Okay, so it's a bit uh, diverse. Maybe people don't use any build tool, just uh, bashing out, banging out uh, Java commands. Uh, no. So um, I'm going to refer again to the JVM ecosystem report. Maven is still uh, the market leader in the Java space of uh, build tools. So I'm going to start with a, a Maven tip for you guys. Don't use the Maven job type. When you create a new job, you get the option to choose from several job types. One is the freestyle job type, and one is the Maven project. And the Maven project, they, well, they promise to drastically reduce the configuration of your job. They do. They do make up to that promise. But they also drastically reduce your flexibility of your job. You're really tied to that Maven specific setup. And it's doing some magic to make sure that the test results are recorded and that you get a nice test report and some other stuff. And it is because of this magic, uh, Maven intercepting difficult stuff, that we ran multiple times into the issue that a Maven build that was working locally wouldn't work on Jenkins unless we ran it as a freestyle job and there was no issue. It was a Maven project, broke down. So don't use the Maven project. Now, another job type that I uh, want to spend well, quite some time on is one that has been introduced uh, uh, one and a half years ago, and it's called a pipeline. And it is a job configuration as code. The description says that it's really used for orchestrating long-running processes, so really a yeah, deployment pipeline from development all the way to production. You can manage that with a pipeline. Pipelines are defined in a Jenkins file that you have in your uh, repository. Or alternatively, if you create a job, you can also manually enter all the or copy paste a Jenkins file uh, in a groovy editor. Um, and this is how the Hello World example looks like. And I'm going to go into uh, all the directives uh, in the next tips. So I want to start with stages. Stages are groups of steps that logically belong together. Uh, an example, build is a group of set, a set of steps that belongs together, test, deploy, etc. And we define these stages because you can get a nice graphical overview out of them. You nicely see uh, how much time is also taken in each step so you know uh, where you may optimize or what to expect. And yeah, it's pretty okay overview or to see what's happening in your in your job. Uh, the big tip here is uh, keep the number of stages small and keep also the titles small. You see I abbreviated acceptance and production because else it wouldn't fit on my screen because it just scales horizontally so uh, you get a nice horizontal scroll bar. Then we already said during the setup that you should do your work on agents. And in pipelines, that's no different. This is how you specify it. You have an agent directive. If you say agent any, it will try to find any agent that can handle this job. And you can also be more specific here with labels on agents and many other ways. And it's generally good practice to run uh, on an agent and not on the master. Unless you are waiting for user input. Because we have a fancy user input, a manual step in your release process, but this blocks your executor where you're running on. So if we go to the case where we only have a master with two executors, well, if I have two, two deployments waiting to go to production, I can't build anything anymore. So how do we work around this? Well, the best way uh, to do this is to use agent none. And agent none means we're going to run on the master in a little hidden flight weight executor. 
we have to define none uh, on the global level, but we don't really want to do anything except for waiting for the input in the none, because it's the Jenkins master, and it's hosting the UI. If you're going to do big, heavy builds there, your UI becomes unresponsive, and you don't want that. So if you've got to do any actual work, then make sure that you say agent any or agent label uh, for Java or whatever. But then as soon as you need input from the user, then you should go back to the Jenkins master. Now Docker images can also function as an agent. Um, you can use that either via the Swarm plugin or directly in a pipeline by specifying it like this. So here we, what Jenkins does in this case, at the start of its uh, run, it spins up a Docker in this uh, image, in this case of node uh, 7, and it will run all the steps that are defined next inside that Docker container. It will also mount your uh, workspace folder inside that Docker container. So if you did a git checkout in an earlier step, those files are all available inside your node Docker container. And anything that you generate in your Docker container is also available uh, after you go out of the Docker container again. So for example, if we do uh, npm test, we want the test results to make a nice report in Jenkins out of them. That's fine, that works. But typically, this is also a nice example of an ephemeral image. We spin up a Node 7 image, and then we throw it away. And the next run, we spin up a new image, and we throw it away again. This might not always be what you want. Uh, Node, and especially Maven, they're well known for downloading half the internet when they're building. But thankfully, we can solve that with persistent storage. So in this example, um, we use a Maven image, and we make sure that we mount the .m2 folder where Maven typically stores its repository, its local repository, and we mount that to a persistent folder on uh, the, the worker that's running the Docker images. So this way, it doesn't have to re-download all the Maven plugins again. Now, it's good to uh, realize how, how, these, uh, yeah, how the files work. So if we say an agent uh, Docker image as an agent, Jenkins will just go around and look for a machine that's capable of running Docker images. And that may not be the same machine. For example, at our company, we have a big uh, cluster, eight big physical machines, and we say, if you need any Docker image, just use one of those eight machines. But it does mean that subsequent runs of a job uh, can run on different physical machines, or even different steps in your pipeline if you use different Docker images at the same time. So the way to go about synchronizing your files in that case is not by assuming that you're always going to run on one specific executor. You shouldn't also lock yourself down to one specific executor, because if that one is full and the seven others are doing nothing, then why would you wait for the full one? But a pipeline can stash files. It's, um, you specify which files you want to store. It will send those over to the uh, Jenkins master. And then in the next steps, it will, you will unstash those files to use them. And those can, will, if needed, they will be retrieved from the Jenkins master again. And it looks uh, something like this. And a nice example uh, for this would be we have a, a build process that ends up with a a uh, jar for Windows and a jar for Linux. We run that on any agent that can compile Java. Fine. Um, but then we're going to test it. That's going to be the next stage. Then we're going to run on a machine that has Linux, the agent label Linux. And then we unstash those jars. And then we run our check. And we can repli re uh, repeat this last step for different operating systems where needed. Then we also sometimes want to lock resources. Stuff sometimes will break if you hammer it with 20 jobs at the same time. And you can do that pretty easily in a, in a pipeline. Um, you have to uh, specify your lock, uh, create it in the settings, and then you can use it like this. And if a job has a lock, it should 
come out of that lock hopefully soon enough so that the other jobs can then do their, get their share of that resource. Um, but this is a nice way to, to make sure that you don't do two uh, concurrent deployments or something. Then we have in a job, you can use uh, parameters. You can also use those in a uh, pipeline. They are accessible as uh, params dot and then the parameter name that you gave it. Um, and uh, the, the, the you define them like this, just a parameters block. It's pretty straightforward. But there is one big catch here. Uh, there is a bit of an um, issue with the order in which stuff is executed. Typically, you start a job. It will then fetch the Jenkins file from Git, check it. Oh, I have parameters. And then continue with its work. But then it already has started the job. So you already entered some parameters or not. So when you change your parameters, make sure that they have a sensible default value. Because the first run you're going to run, they won't be set yet. Any subsequent runs, yeah, sure. We know from the last time that we have parameters. So maybe we should ask them now again. But that's uh, something that you should, uh, should keep in mind. Then we want to parallelize stuff sometimes. Typical example, some slow stuff. End-to-end -end tests at our place take quite some time. Performance test takes quite some time. Let's run those in parallel. And here also the suggestion, make sure that you do those on different nodes. Doesn't really make sense to have one CPU intensive process parallel with another one, but then on the same physical machine, so that they're still slow. Um, this is uh, one way of parallelizing chunks of work. Uh, you can also parallelize uh, your Maven tests. And you don't have to remember this, but there is a split test uh, directive that will look at the previous runs to make sure uh, to, to yeah, uh, split the test into uh, several buckets that are make sense to run in parallel. And then you have to do some Maven magic to, uh, to use that. And this isn't a full example. The full example is this. It's a bit of work to set up, but if you have like a big legacy Maven uh, project, this might be worth uh, investigating. We cut our CR times from one hour to 15 minutes by uh, parallelizing tests alone. Uh, most of the examples I've shown are the so-called declarative pipeline. But there's also a scripted pipeline. What's the difference? The scripted pipeline is the version that they uh, started with at Jenkins. And it's was really flexible and nice. And you could do almost everything with it, um, except for validating your pipeline. What you would have to do was to change your pipeline, commit it, run it. Oh, now I get an error. Try something else, commit. So you would end up in a try, commit, retry loop. That wasn't really nice. So they figured, what if we make an easy to use pipeline syntax? They called it declarative syntax. And it's easy to use. It's a bit more concise, because script also has some boilerplate. And we make sure that we have validation before we run the pipeline. So you know something is wrong before you actually see it go wrong. And uh, th that's what they did. That's basically the difference between declarative and scripted. The advantage of declarative is, is that because it is so strict, uh, there is a visual editor for it. Whereas in scripted, uh, it's just groovy. So any groovy editor uh, might help you or not. Uh, I would say that declarative is uh, perfect for the regular users. If you now want to try something out with a pipeline, please use declarative. But the power users will typically uh, grab to the scripted because some things just aren't possible in declarative. You can use snippets of scripted pipeline in your declarative pipeline as well. That's uh, also a possibility. That's why the I put the power users on, on both sides of both declarative and scripted. Then, I also want to stress that you should keep your pipelines small. 
you can make these really intricate release scripts, deployment stuff, uh, and we did. We ended up with a pipeline of 1,000 lines of code, and it's pretty hard to maintain. Uh, again, also the try, commit, retry, because you can't do anything, everything in declarative. And what you might also see is that you run into a uh, sandbox, because it's groovy, you can do anything, yeah, but we don't want you to read all the credentials that are in Jenkins or something. So uh, there is a sandbox in place, and we quite often ran into the, the sandbox. So my suggestion is that, because it's also hard to test, um, you can better work with, with maybe even small shell scripts that you can just run locally on your machine, test it there, and then if you call that shell script, it's just one line of pipeline code, but it's easily testable and verifiable. Then I have uh, another more advanced topic in pipelines. That pipelines are they're, they're great. If your Jenkins master crashes while a pipeline is in progress, no problem. We can resume where we were before it crashed. But the downside of this is that everything has to be, all the intermediate steps in a pipeline need to be serializable because that's how they implemented it. As soon as a step is done, store the result on disk, and if it crashes, then we can restore the result and then continue where we left off. And they do this in the continuation passing style of programming. And uh, yeah, it uh, took me quite some, uh, quite some lessons at the, uh, at the university, uh, the, the course uh, Principles of Programming Languages, to wrap my head around this, but it's a, uh, way of programming, and uh, it's suitable for this uh, for this application. But it has the downside that if you want to do anything in, in your Groovy script that is uh, not serializable, the pipeline will complain, hey, I can't store this, so uh, you're not allowed to do that. Now, there's a way around this. You should create a method and annotate it with the add non-CPS annotation. And that way you will instruct the pipeline runner to say, hey, whatever happens in this method, you don't have to store the intermediate results. If you crash while this is in progress, it's fine. Just start over, calculate it again. Um, and you're going to need this, for example, uh, if you use uh, uh, the Groovy template engine, because the template engines do not implement serializable. I don't know if there are any Groovy pros in the room here, but I'm using the streaming template engine and not the simple template engine, because the simple template engine somehow leaks a serializable variable, even though it's in a non-CPS block, so I don't really know what's happening there, but streaming template engine works, just roll with that. Now, pipelines sometimes also can get stuck, and then you need to abort them. Aborting a job in Jenkins is pretty easy. There's a little red cross after the job, just hit it, and with a pipeline, nothing happens. And a, a colleague of mine tried this and, and came up to me, I can't abort my job, what's happening? So we had a look in the console logs of that job, and Jenkins put some links in there. Hey, if you really want to stop this, <laughs> you have to click here. So if you find out that your job isn't, uh, your pipeline isn't aborting properly, check the logs, and be sure to click several times, because you first terminate the running steps, and then you have to terminate the build. Then, um, are you ready for some fancy GUIs? Because Jenkins is looking a bit like, well, it did maybe eight years ago. But we can change that. There is a new GUI for Jenkins. And the job overview, now looks something like this. It's called Blue Ocean, and yeah, it has a bit more modern look than the old Jenkins. Uh, it's not necessarily ideally for pro users of Jenkins because they do smooth scrolling, and uh, if you reach the end of the list, then we're gonna asynchronously load the rest of it. And if I want to look at 100 jobs, that's not really easy. But for uh, typical users, this is a perfectly nice view. Uh, if you click uh, one of your jobs, then you can get also a nice overview of the previous uh, RAN uh, steps. 
But the real, real nice part is when I open up one of these pipeline runs, and then you'll see this. And you're like, whoa, is this even Jenkins? But it is. And uh, it's still a work in progress, so some features are still not implemented. But if you have a bit up-to-date Jenkins, you can switch in your settings to use this, uh, this view. And it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely useful for uh, simple, uh, simple use cases. Now, I also already mentioned that there's a pipeline editor that's also part of this uh, Blue Ocean UI, and it's only for declarative pipelines. Uh, some tricks here, uh, your pipelines must have write credentials because they store it in their Jenkins file, so they have to put it in your repository. And you will lose any comments or stuff that you added because, well, it's automated. A robot doesn't have to read that, so uh, we're going to throw it away. And the order is also, yeah, we're going to create our own order. Now, what we also saw when we were playing around with these pipelines is that uh, people tend to copy-paste stuff from other pipelines. Uh, one specific case was our script to deploy a service to Kubernetes. We create the deployment YAML and then call some kubectl commands. And well, everybody was just copying it over from the, the other service. And then, yeah, we got the same problems that you get with code when you're copying, uh, you're copying everything. So the next tip is to use shared libraries. If you have any common code, you should not repeat yourself. You can pull it out into a library and then make sure that everybody just uses that library. And you can also use files in these shared libraries. So for example, we have our deployment YAML that's just a simple template YAML. It's in the shared library, so all our services use the same deployment YAML. Don't repeat yourself also with files. Now developing these libraries is uh, suffers a bit the same from developing a scripted uh, pipeline. Try it out. You have to Commit again, try it out again, commit again, try it out again. But in the end, it, it, it may well be worth it. Now, this was all I wanted to say about, about jobs. Let's move on to the third part, security and monitoring of your Jenkins jobs. Um, I'm going to show you a screenshot I took from a computer of a colleague of mine, and I want to know if this is relatable to you guys. In Outlook, if I get an email from Jenkins, put it to the trash. Apparently, this colleague was so fed up with all the emails he got from Jenkins that he said, no, I'm not going to look at them again. So this is not what we have a Jenkins instance for. We don't want this. <laughs> so how can we improve on this? Because emails, it's not maybe not the best medium anymore for, for monitoring and alerting. What you can do is you can create your own view in Jenkins. Just hit the My Views, click New View, and then you can select your own list of jobs that you want to see. And you can even use reg uh, regular expressions here. So if you're working on a certain project and I want to see all the jobs of this project, fine. Throw in a regular expression, and then you'll end up with something like this. It gives you a nice overview of the jobs you're interested in. But yeah, this is not really that nice. It's uh, not really a nice uh, overview. You, you can't get a quick glance to see what the current status is of the project. Can we do better? Well, we can, luckily. I want less emails, more build monitor, so we're going to use the build monitor view. It works the same way as the other view. You specify jobs in the same way, but it just looks much nicer. Every team in our company has a big monitor in the room, and all these monitors typically show the projects that that team is currently working on or responsible for. And with this, you can, at a quick glance, you can see, oh, there's one job that's yellow, and the rest is green. Good. Um, so this is one from actually from one of our teams. And yeah, quite a lot of information with a quick glance. Now, I also want to tell you that there is an API in Jenkins. Almost everything has an API. You can reach it by going to, in the UI, just go to a URL, to uh, whatever you want, 
then in the address bar of your browser, at slash API. And then uh, you'll get some instructions how to use it. It's typically available in JSON and XML. And uh, one example call that I'll, I'll show here uses my uh, build monitor view that I had. And I want to get the JSON. And from all the jobs, I want to see the color. And the color represents the status of the job. So if it's yellow, there are test failures. If it's blue or green, depending if you have the, it's one of the most installed plugins in Jenkins, the green balls plugin, to make sure that all the blue balls turn into green, because green apparently is even better than blue. Um, but we get this uh, this feedback, and this works on almost every every endpoint in Jenkins. Now I want to combine this with my build monitor, because people are not getting paid to watch the build monitor screen all the time. It's on a screen in the room, but yeah, you can you're just looking at your own screen, so maybe you don't see it if something turns red on it. And I figured out a way to grab people's attention when something turns red. And it's called extreme feedback. So it's a little, little warning light with the controlled by a USB relay. It's hooked up to the computer that's also powering the, the, the screen. And it's just, yeah, pulling Jenkins to see, hey, is the all everything green? And if it's not, it will start turning. It's really cheap. It doesn't have any bearings. But it's not just plastic. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, you really want to keep your build screen. And yeah, this is what we call extreme feedback. Something in the real life is happening uh, and controlled by an API that's talking to, for example, Jenkins. Um, I have been experimenting a bit with uh, other ways of giving feedback. Uh, these include uh, uh, Nerf guns, drones, uh, controlling cars over the OBD protocol, and I wrote them all down on a uh, post in our uh, tech blog. So, uh, also added some movies there. Not won't go into detail uh, much further here. Then, another useful tip is that build numbers are more than integers. If you want to refer the fourth build of my job, then you can use this URL, or if you use the GUI, then you will end up at this URL. But in the GUI, there's also a little drop-down, uh, and you can select uh, yeah, other builds. And these also directly map to URLs. So if you just do my job, last build, you'll get the last build. And uh, these are some of the options that are available there. And this is also really useful to uh, use in comp uh, together with the API. Then another big project that was launched last year is called Jenkins X. And this is really a topic that, uh, well, is worth worthy uh, its own uh, presentation. Jenkins X is a CI CD solution for modern cloud applications on Kubernetes. Basically, they say, oh, this is not a Jenkins project. We are providing easy to use complete CI CD solution from development all the way to production into Kubernetes. Uh, but we are going to use Jenkins for that. So it's uh, opinionated. It's really, you got to use Kubernetes. You got to use GitOps in this case. Um, but then you can really, with one command, set up your almost your entire infrastructure as well. So you don't have to manage a Jenkins anymore. That's all part of the package. And you can find out more uh, on this page. Then I also promised to talk a bit about security. And the easiest trick to do to stay secure is to stay up to date. Jenkins will nowadays uh, tell you that there are some uh, security warnings. And if we expand those, one of the security warnings is that, hey, there's a new version of Jenkins release released. Maybe you should upgrade. Now, why would anyone upgrade? I have no idea what a hacker can do if they access a server that controls a whole lot of other servers with a lot of CPU power and stuff like that. Oh, maybe we can just turn them into Bitcoin miners. 
So a vulnerability that was fixed in April 2017, uh, many people didn't patch in February 2018, and suddenly a lot of Jenkins servers became coin mining slaves. So keep them up to date. That's the first tip. The other warning that I uh, that's available that's shown here is about cross-site request forgery. Um, if you don't do anything, you're vulnerable to it. In Jenkins, you can configure it to use a uh, yeah, cross-site request forgery. Uh, you send a token so that you know that every request that you receive was also issued by the user that was expected to issue it. Um, one way to do this um, is to execute this command to get the, uh, they call it a crumb, uh, the CSERF token. You get it in the output, and then you add that to your request, and this way you know that uh, no nobody has tampered with the request. Uh, we do use quite an interesting XML uh, construction in the first command, but that's because the crumb field has changed. It used to be called dot uh, crumb, and now it's the crumb request field. So the top command works for all Jenkins versions. Then we also have to talk about uh, the JNLP. It's the protocol that's used to connect to agents. Uh, the Swarm plugin uses this. Uh, this is the third warning that I had open here. And yeah, the, the older versions of the protocol are not as stable, not as secure, so use the last version of the protocol. And it will, by default, try to use the latest version. So uh, in our case, we really had some fixed on old versions. Then I want to spend the last minutes on CloudBees. It's the company that has adopted Jenkins, and they do try to make money of it. But they do reserve also some credit for all the work on the open source uh, version of Jenkins, because quite a lot of their time and work goes into the open source Jenkins. The original creator of, uh, Jackson, of, of Hudson and uh, Jenkins also works at CloudBees. And, uh, CloudBees, for example, also provide uh, certificates. I don't know if in the Netherlands, certificates are like, yeah, we can get them, but they s say they boost your, boost your uh, chances when you do job interviews, but in the Netherlands, that's not really that true. Uh, in Germany, certificates are all the rage. If you don't have your wall behind your desk full of certificates, then you're not really a developer. How is that in, in Denmark? Certificates, yay or nay? Yay? Nay? Okay, so if you really want, you can. If not, yeah, then you don't. <laughs> um, they also have some enterprise features. So if you found that you're running into limitations of the open source Jenkins, uh, high availability, better monitoring, scaling with multiple masters, CloudBees does it. Looks like this. Uh, I have to say we support a hundred developers with one big Jenkins master. And it's just open source. We have no need for, for CloudBees uh, Jenkins yet. Then I want to end up with a list of my favorite plugins. So uh, quickly go over them. The build monitor already shown. The job config history gives you uh, yeah, a history on other job types than your Jenkins file. Jenkins file is in, in Git, so that's easy to have a history on it. This will also provide it to the freestyle and Maven jobs. Should you use them? Don't do that. Then the job DSL is a DSL to quickly create jobs. That's what we use to power our end-to-end -end tests. It creates, uh, yeah, it automatically creates 100 jobs. Um, throttle concurrent builds will make sure that uh, the builds are scheduled nicely over all our available executors. The timestamper plugin will show the timestamp on each log line, so that is very useful to see where your time is spent uh, during a build. And the last one, the version number plugin, really lets you uh, configure the version of your job. And that's what we use in our release process. And then with the build name setter, we make sure that all the builds are titled to the actual version that they built, and not just one, two, three, four, five. So these were the tips I had in store for you. Um, if you have any questions, well, you can ask them in the app. Um, but you can also take them to Stack Overflow, the Jenkins uh, Tag is, is uh, pretty active, uh, high quality answers there. 
Um, I would also like to recommend our, our tech blog. Uh, we not only have uh, funny stuff about drones and nerf guns, but also currently doing a big series on what developers should know about security. Uh, and you can reach me on, uh, on Twitter if you'd like. Um, and then, uh, final words, uh, please remember to rate this session and all the sessions. You can get a nice charger, I saw. And, um, well, if you like it, the green smiley is uh, the one to go for. If you have improvements, then sure, feel free. If it's not really what you expect, feel free to take it to, to use the red or the, the yellow smiley. But I want to please ask you to also fill in just a quick comment on, on why you, this uh, session was not what you expected of it. And this goes for all, all speakers. We are all trying to improve, obviously. So if it's not what you expected it to be, or maybe you don't like a format of quickly rushing through slides, that's fine, but please let us know. And with that, I thank you.